I'm Katie and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you and your family are here and we would love to get connected with you. One easy way you can do that is text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website, therivertrch.cc, to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Morning, everybody. If you have a Bible, let's open them up to the Old Testament, to the book of Job. It is spelled in the same way we would spell the word job but it is pronounced Job, right before the book of Psalms, Job chapter number one. Great to see you today, glad to uh, be together. If you're a guest, I want to welcome you. Thanks for being with us today, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to take out your phone Download a Bible app or the River Church app. And there's a Bible feature on there. I want to be encouraging you to see the scripture for yourself. As Keaton mentioned earlier, we're beginning a new series today. And it is a very uh, personal series to me. And one that I've wrestled with for uh, just over 10 years. And so if the sermons are bad, sorry about that. Um, but uh, over the last 10 years, around 2012, uh, I was reading the scripture, and uh, I use a new Bible every year just because I kind of journal in the empty pages and in the margins, and um, as I read through things, I try to stay fresh year to year. And I was writing down some things that I was just kind of noticing in the Bible, and I uh, half-jokingly wrote in the front of my Bible uh, the most important truths. And as I was reading through the scripture, I started to see these things and I kind of laughed. I thought, you know, that's just kind of a, what I dubbed a biblical hypothesis, just kind of maybe a, a summary. And I honestly thought it was an oversimplification. And so the next year I got a new Bible and I started reading through it and, and I find myself write, writing the same notes in the front the most important truths, and I just kind of jotted them down, and the more that I read the Bible, the more I found myself flipping back to the front and writing scriptures next to that and thinking, man, I, I think this is true. And so for the next several years, that's, that's what I did. To about 2017, I was meeting a guy in our church for lunch at one of my favorite places, and uh, looking forward to having uh, a good lunch together. And I walked in, and it was a Tuesday in early 2017. And a Tuesday is a very busy day for me. It's kind of my office day. And so we have our elder meetings in the morning and then um, location pastor meetings and then different team meetings throughout the day. It's pretty um, strenuous and kind of emotionally, mentally, spiritually challenging. And I walked in, and my mind was somewhere else, and I said hi to my buddy, and he said, hey, how, how are you? And it was a genuine how are you, and so I just kind of unloaded. And uh, I don't know if you have friends that you can do that with. I hope you do. And uh, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I just, we were standing there in line at Chipotle, and I just started unloading on him, you know, what I was frustrated by. And then it hit me. And uh, it kind of hit me like a Mack truck, I'll be honest with you that I hadn't thought about him at all. And I realized in that moment his only child was in the hospital and she was fighting for her life. And um, she had spent her whole life in the hospital. And I, I, I remember just feeling so sick to my stomach, like, gosh, Josh, you are a moron. You are a selfish jerk. And I remember saying, I'm sorry, buddy. I just, oh, I'm an idiot. What's, what's happening with you? And my friend just began to cry. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, why is this happening? And I thought, okay, he's going to ask about his daughter. 
who was born with a congenital heart and lung defect. And he said, why is this happening? He began to ask me about families and children that he was meeting at C.S. Mott Hospital. He said, one of our friends that we met there, their child just died. Why is this happening? Why is God doing this? We got our food. We went and sat at a little booth. I could take you to the booth right now. And he just began to pour out, why is this happening? Why is this going on? And I knew sitting in my car outside was a, my Bible. And in the front cover was some notes labeled the most important truths. And I just felt the small, still small voice of the Lord say, show them, tell them. So I said to my friend, hey, let me, let me go to my car. I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to get my Bible. And I walked in and I opened my Bible and I just shared with him what I had been learning in the scripture. It wasn't easy. It wasn't like I was giving him simple answers. It wasn't like the word of God was without mystery. Or it wasn't that we were just going to sit there and not have to wrestle through some truths. But I shared it with him. And from that moment, that conversation, to be honest with you, changed my life. And something started to happen in me. And my wife said, you know, you need to write that down. You need to write that as a book. And I was like, okay, I should do that. And then she would say, hey, you need to write that as a book. And then I would say, okay. And she'd say, hey, have you written that book yet? i say, leave me alone. And she said, you need to write that down as a book. And um, my wife is not a nag in any way, shape, or form. But my wife's encouragement is what brought the book to fruition. And so over the next month, I want to uh, take you through what I told my friend um, and try to encourage you. Because for each of us in this room, if we're honest, there are times where we look to God and we say, why? Like, what the heck is going on? Like, why my family? Like, why my husband? Why my wife? Why my child? Why me? And we wrestle with God. We wrestle with God about, you know, God, what are you doing? And then moments of doubt creep in and we think, is God doing something? Is God mad at me? Is this payback? Is this generational sin revisited? And we wrestle with that. And I want you to know right out of the gate that God is big enough, strong enough, loving enough for all of those questions. And if someone says to you, don't ask God why, don't listen to him. Because First Peter says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And sometimes you got to go to God like the psalmist and say, hello, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? Are you hearing me? Have you forgotten me? Do you care for me? And God is big enough, 
and loving enough and so wonderful, he can handle all of that. So over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at those truths. I should probably bring Kleenex with me every week. And um, that's where we're going to be. So let's pray together, okay? Lord, thank you for your love and mercy and patience for who you are. And Lord, I just pray for the next few weeks that you would just do a marvelous work in anchoring our hearts to you. I pray for those, Lord, here who right now have a broken heart. And I thank you, Lord, that you are the healer and mender of broken hearts and broken spirits. So we come to you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Apparently, Kleenex fall from heaven. (laughs) Job chapter one, everybody. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would stand and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So this book of poetry begins with a really wonderful summary of this man named Job. Job is described as a blameless man, an upright, a morally upright man, and a man who fears God and turns away from evil. We're given in verse 2 some of the summary of his, the extent of his blessedness, his wealth. Seven sons, three daughters, and a listing of all of his flocks and so forth. And his family dynamic, they enjoyed one another. Each son took, it seems, a day of the week and hosted a feast or hosted dinner at his house. And it would invite all of the brothers and all of the sisters, and they would go to that house. And the next day, they would go to the other brother's house, and they they enjoyed being together. And Job, being a a faithful father, interceded and prayed for his sons and daughters. He thought, maybe my sons and daughters may have sinned against the Lord or something is wrong in their hearts, and I will go to God on their behalf, and not just for one of them, but I will make a burnt offering, a sacrifice for each of them. Verse 5 ends with this phrase, thus Job did continually. So he was seeking the Lord constantly, continually for his sons and daughters. If we just stop there, what a summary, what a, uh, a biography of a godly man. Verse 6, now there was a day 
when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, the abrupt change from verse 5 to verse 6 is like, wait, what am I reading here? We're reading about Job, good guy, prays for his kids, family gets along, he's been blessed materially by the Lord, all of these different things, and now we're gear shifting from earth to heaven. The Bible says here, the sons of God, meaning the angels, came before God, and among the angels came Satan, the devil, who's known as the accuser of the brethren or the adversary, and he comes into heaven. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. 1 Peter 5 says that we are to be sober, to be vigilant. We have an adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour And so Satan, the Lord says to Satan, where have you come? I've come from the earth and I've been up and down. I've been all over it. And the Lord said to Satan, now that's just mind blowing to think about. Have you considered my servant Job? Now the scripture says there that Job in verse one is a man who fears God, turns away from evil, is morally upright and blameless. Look at what God says about Job. First of all, he identifies him as my servant. And God says, there is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. This is what God says about this man, Job. So it's not just uh, smoke. No, No one's blowing smoke. This is not Job trying to convince people that he's an upright, blameless man. God says of Job that he's a good man. And there's nobody like him. Satan answered the Lord, verse 9, says, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, his possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Satan says, well, sure he does those things. Look at what you've done for him. I mean, sure he runs away from evil and is blameless and is upright, Look at the blessing. You've put a hedge around him, and he's incredibly blessed. But if you take those things away from him, Satan says to God, Job will curse you to your face. You think he's upright? Take the blessing away from him. See what he does then. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him, him physically, personally, do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now I want you to see the perspective here of the the narrative or the story. We as the reader understand what's happening in heaven. Job, he's just on earth. Satan says, you take the blessing away from him, he'll curse you to his face. So God says, okay. All that Job has is yours. But you, Satan, can't touch Job. So Satan leaves the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters, this is Job, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. There came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. I want you to, if you can cross-reference this, look back to verse number three. Um, How many oxen and how many donkeys? Uh, 500 yoke of oxen, so 1,000 oxen paired up, so into 500 and then female, 500 female donkeys. So these guys come, they take a massive amount of animals that belong to Job. They killed all the servants, but one escaped to return and tell Job. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven, burned up the sheep 
and the servants. How, how many sheep? 7,000 sheep. And, and the fire killed the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups, made a raid upon the camels, so 3,000 camels, and took them, struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. One servant shows up with a catastrophe to report, and the, while he is just in the middle of speaking, the next servant lines up and says, well, he's done, I got more news for you. And the next servant shows up and it's like, Job, all of those things that were talked about in verse two and three are gone. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, but not just the animals, your seven sons and daughters died. The house collapsed and they're all dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 20, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground and worshiped and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return, meaning I didn't bring anything to this world and apparently I'm taking nothing out of it. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And what a challenge. What a crisis. I mean, I'm glad that's all over, but the devastation that Job and his family are in it's just awful. And yet there's not a note at the end of chapter one that says they grieved, but they lived happily ever after. Chapter two begins with the word again. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before, before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's an unlike him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God, turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. And Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. Stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Where's Job? Job's not in heaven. Job's on earth. All of his children have died. All of his wealth is gone in a single day. And yet God says of him, he is still my servant. He is still upright. He's still blameless. There's none like him. He turns away from evil. And even in the midst of this trial, he holds fast to his integrity. Satan says, okay. Yeah, but you wouldn't let me touch him. You let me touch him, and he'll curse you to your face. And God says, okay. I'm putting Job in your hand, only you can't take him, take his life. Verse 7, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. I think this is just a lady who's overcome with grief who says, let's just be done with this. 
Obviously, God's mad at you. Let's be mad at God. Curse God and die. Look at what has happened to you. Look at what's happened to us. He says to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil or disaster? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's stuck on earth. He doesn't know what's happening in heaven. He only knows what's happening in front of him, his family, his finances, and now his health. Maybe you feel like Job. Maybe not on the scale of that. But something has struck your life, your family, your health, your finances. And you think, why? What's going on? God, where are you? And behind that question is the foundation. If we, if we just kind of sort through it and we get to the core of it, the foundation of that is our theology. Now, don't be intimidated by that word at all. It just means the study of God. So when we talk about theology, every person in here has a theology. It means what you think about God, what you believe about God. And I want you to know this, what you believe about God is what you expect of him. It's what you expect God to do. A lot of people's theology, view of God, belief of God, whether young or old, is do good and get good. Right, if I behave, if I'm moral, if I do what I'm supposed to, then I've kind of struck this deal with God that God will give good to me. But we look at Job, and even God says on earth there's no one like him. So that even if it is a soft prosperity gospel is wrong. The idea that if we do good, God then owes us good or God is obligated to give us good. Or do bad and get bad. And we use things like that person is uh, uh, reaping what they sowed or we might use a more commonly used word, karma. And we would say that about someone. Look, well, that's, they're getting what they deserve. And we view God as kind of this, um, if you will, Santa Claus type character. I want to stay on the nice list and off the naughty list. And if I'm on God's nice list, he and I are on good terms. When I need something, I can go sit on his lap and it'll show up on Christmas Day. Or maybe your theology, you view God more as an angry God. I, when I was young, we grew up in a denomination that was very much, we viewed God as, at least for me it was, God was very angry. Like God was not to be crossed. The image I remember hearing is that God was, you know, standing on the edge of a cloud, you know, pistol in hand saying, go ahead, make my day. <laughs> I remember hearing that. As a matter of fact, I remember hearing my dad use that illustration and thinking, well, isn't that how God is? Because I cussed yesterday and man, everything has fallen apart today. So I'm going to be good this week so things will piece themselves back together. Maybe you grew up Catholic. I mean, I thought the Baptists were good at guilt. You guys are the pros, <laughs> right? People feel a lot of guilt. And so we view God as angry, ready to punish at a moment's notice. 
And yet we see with Job that there was no secret sin. Job was not being punished. Maybe your theology leads you to be more of a deist. And what we mean by that is, okay, God created the heavens and the earth, but he's kind of distant and, and doesn't really have any interaction or care with what's going on. And yet we see in the story of Job in Job chapter 1 and 2, I want you to take note, verse 3, chapter 2 and verse 3, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Have you seen my servant Job? What's, what's implied there? God saying, have you seen him? I certainly have. Meaning God in chapter one and chapter two is saying, I'm fully aware of who Job is. I'm fully aware of what's going on. So God is not just distant or aloof. He is interacting, sees, and cares. Maybe your theology is more in the present day. We hear a lot about God is love. I would have said John 3.16 was the most quoted Bible verse for a long time. I would say now it is God is love. God is love. God is love. So the idea meaning anything that's bad or any disaster, that's not God. And so we have to come up with, we have to conceive who's at the source of that. And so who's an easy person to point to or who's an easy being to point to? We can point to the devil. So then we imagine that God and Satan are locked in an epic battle. And we really, really hope that God wins. And here we are caught in the middle. And so we wonder who's in control. If you take out chapter 1, verse 6 through 12 which we're obviously not going to do. And if you take out chapter two, one through six, man, that would leave me if I was Job going, seriously? Round one was terrible. Round two, I, I can't even work. I can't even pick myself up to start to piece things, my life, my business back together. Why, God? This seems so chaotic. This seems out of control. But what does this scripture do for us, the reader? It gives us the heavenly view. And we see something really important. We see that Job is not in control. And we see that Satan is not in control. We see that God is in control. And that Satan could not do anything unless God said, okay. Look at chapter two, verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place. Jumping later in the verse, they made an appointment together to come show him sympathy and comfort him. Look at verse 12. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to read right now from those verses till the end of chapter 37, everybody. So we're going to be here a minute. Not really. Beginning in chapter 3 to the end of verse, the end of chapter 37, is Job's interaction with his friends. Job's business has been lost. His children have died. Job's 
devastated physically with boils from head to toe. He's sitting in ashes. His friends see him at a distance and don't even recognize him because he's such a disaster physically. And then they show up to help him. And Job, for the next 20 plus chapters, 30 plus chapters, his friends begin to probe at him. Well, maybe this is why God is doing this. Maybe you have some secret sin. Maybe this is why God has brought this disaster upon your life because this is going on. And Job is defending himself. Now, just a preview at the end of the book, God says of these friends, you have not spoken of me what is right. You better ask Job to pray for you because I'm about to crush you. Here's just a practical point. You and I need to be careful who we're listening to when someone tells us about God. You be real careful. Because there's a whole bunch of garbage in the supposed Christian bookstore that says God will do this or God won't do that. And you'll have some friends that'll show up I'm not trying to insult your friends or folks who have been a blessing to you, but you'll have some friends who will show up and say, oh, no, that's not God, that's the devil. The first place we need to go to to understand who the Lord is, who God is, is God's word. That needs to be what shapes your theology, what you believe and think about God because there are a lot of supposed Christians, professing Christians, who settle for secondhand knowledge of God or Bible sounding pithy sayings that aren't in the scripture. Things like, hey, don't ask God why. or my favorite that we're gonna punch in the face for four straight weeks. God will never give you more than you can handle. That is crap. <laughs> Sorry. It's total garbage. God will give you more than you can handle so that you will come to him. But Job only saw the earthly perspective. And so he began to wrestle through his trials. I want you to jump to the end of the book, Job chapter number 42. after the friends have exhausted their supposed wisdom, God speaks. And this is Job's response after hearing from the Lord. Chapter 42, verse 1, then, the, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Look at verse 2 again. Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You can write these down in your notes. Psalm chapter 57 and verse 2. David says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. David says in Psalm 138, 8, 
the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Not just in Job, but in all of the scripture, we see this. God is in complete control. God is never operating in plan B mode. God has a plan, and from the very beginning, he has declared the end. You can hold your spot in Job and go to the right just a little bit to Isaiah chapter number 46. Isaiah chapter number 46, and we'll pick up verse number 8. We see it in Job, we see it in the scripture, we're gonna see it here in just a moment. In Isaiah 46, God is in complete control. He truly does have the whole world in his hands. And personally, for you, for me, in trials or in triumph, here's what we can do. We can trust that God is in complete control. It's a heavy thing. It's not an easy thing. It's not without mystery. But God's in control. The world's not out of control. God's in control. Isaiah 46, verse 8, the prophet says, speaking for God, remember this and stand firm. I want you to see this. Remember this and stand firm. Meaning don't forget it. And don't be tossed around. You can, you can be stable in a very unsta- what seems like a very unstable world. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all. All my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. What do we see here? From the very beginning, God has declared the very end. That is why he is called the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega. He's the beginning, he's the end, meaning he is coordinating, he is authoring, he is sovereign over all that is in between. So what can we take out of our vocabulary? There's no such thing as an accident. There are no coincidences. We can open the scripture and we can know that God has a plan And he is working out that plan according to the counsel of his will from the very beginning to the very end. 